As you travel through the furthest reaches of the galaxy, you pick up a distant transmission. Signal received. Decrypting message. Welcome to Starchives, presented by Starforce Collective, a crew of spacefaring illustrators on a mission to record nerdy shit for the hope of future generations. Hello, welcome back to Starchives, your cosmic library of everything geeky and nerdy. As always, I am Commander Alex, taking the helm. On my left, hello, Vinod. How's it hello, going, man? Hello, Alex. I'm doing well. Another week aboard the ship. Yeah, man. I've been home now. How have things been? It's been pretty good. Have Working some, away. Have getting some those space cereal for space breakfast cereal. every morning. Space pancakes. Mm, space <laughs> space cakes. Um, we've got our science officer back once again. I think this will be the last time he's aboard for a little while. Um, That's true. Before, Three in a row. Wow. Yeah, before he heads back to uh, Space Ottawa. Space Ottawa. <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about board games, which is not a topic Hunad and I are particular ex- experts in. Um, we have obviously some experience playing them, but we have a uh, verified board game guru with us um, in the name of Kurt Ruffling. So, Kurt, um, you work at Monopolate, which is the, uh, one of the board game cafes in Ottawa. Are there other ones? Uh, yes. The, uh, the landscape is constantly shifting. When we opened, we were the only cafe at that point. Uh, the only board game cafe. Not the only cafe. Nowhere else were there coffees <laughs> in the city. No donuts. But uh, after our opening, uh, we had the loft open which is uh which is a very similar idea and also there are a couple of other enterprises that both opened and shutter their doors in the last two and a half years we had um games for all which was more of a play space you could order food into it that choked uh just not enough not enough booze you could order i guess was the real issue (laughs) there's not enough puns in that title either right oh but on the other side on the other hand you had uh you had the French board game cafe, uh, which was sort of a place on the other side of the Quebec border. Ottawa straddles Ontario and Quebec in Canada, so there's English on one side and French on the other. Uh, so they were uh, they were a francophone specific board game cafe, and then they folded too. But oh. they did have a pun in their name, and that was uh, that was échec et malt, uh, which is a pun on check and mate. Échec is check. Malt is malt in beer. Oh, okay. It was Czech and malt, basically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those Frenchies. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Well, I mean, puns aside, uh, it seems like I've been to Monopolate all of once because uh, like I can't really make it out to Space Ottawa all that much. Uh, fuel costs a lot out here in space, man. Like. Can't just turn on those Game Boys for nothing. Uh, <laughs> Roba! <laughs> In any case, it, it was a nice place. Um, and I like the atmosphere, the general atmosphere that I've gotten from the board game cafe experiences uh, that I've had. I've been to one in Toronto, um, Snakes and Lattes, and uh, obviously I've been to yours. And I just like the idea that you just go hang out and, you know, Maybe make some new friends or just go with friends you've already got. And uh, <laughs> hopefully you're not there by yourself the entire day. And hey, we have some but good solo board games. Tell us about those. I'm kind of curious about, about them. What, okay. uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, when I first heard about the fact that there were solo board games, I thought, oh, that's kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they have friends? But it's actually, it's you know what? You know what? It's good. It's like, and uh, this will sound unappealing, it's like if you had to, if you were playing a solo video game, yeah. but then you had to do like the calculations as well. So you move the character and then you're like, and then how far does the enemy move? Oh, three paces in this direction. Do they shoot? <laughs> no, <Yes>. they don't. <laughs> oh, One of those two, for sure. <laughs> there's two universes there. Yeah. So, uh, right. Solo board games are actually clever. They're a bit like a puzzle. You have, uh, you often have either a high score you're trying to achieve or you're just trying to beat the premise of the game. A lot of cooperative board games, which is a sort of new 
aspect in the last 10 years of board gaming. A lot of cooperative board games have solo play modes. Right. Because you're already, it's just you against the board. Solo board game allows you to take that to the next level. You against the board, and no one's there to see it. Well, I really like that Zombicide game um, that we've played a couple times. And, uh, I mean, for those of you looking for a kind of Walking Dead-ish kind of experience in board game format, it's a uh, pretty strong one um, that I felt. I, I liked all of the art and the uh, the tiles were pretty cool how they interconnected. And, um, Man, the art on, on these board games is is insanely good. It's gotten really good. Yeah. You know, going going back to like the, the old days where the board games in your house were like sorry and <laughs> maybe you know, the staples snakes and ladders. They called the game sorry <laughs> because they were apologizing for the art. Or trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All of these games were very like kind of negative connotations. So like, Jesus Christ, these uh, these board games look awful. They're just, just apologizing. Why oh, would that's you trouble. <laughs> oh, that's trouble right there. Oh, sorry. Oh god. There's a lot of like really minimalistic games too. That it's just like the card games themselves, right? Like Cards Against Humanity, which is the premise is the comedy is provided by the players. Yeah. That's true. There's a whole weave of social board games that have spread across the market. And of course they've always been there. You can go back to the 70s when you have, I'm not making this up, uh, there was a title called The Ungame. It's still kicking around some people's basements probably, uh, where the goal of the game was to, to, to speak with your friends and develop a better understanding of who they were <laughs> as people. Uh, and you still find that kind of thing. There's, as far as I can tell, there's two types of people who come into our cafe. You have one group of people who are very much just looking for like a social night out with friends. They want the board game to be a means of interacting with people. Right. They want it to act as a facilitator of new ways to communicate or a, or a source of humor or maybe just uh, a, a way to talk with your friends with a spur. Uh, on the other hand, you have the group of people who are really just want like yoga, but for their brains. Mm. They want to flex the brain, the brain muscles, uh, and hope to get some kind of intellectual exercise out of it. I guess you have a third group of people who just want to fuck around with games that they grew up with. Your guess who's, your sorries, your troubles, sure. your, dis your art design <laughs> disasters. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> and actually many of these games have been redesigned since so that they actually look much more attractive if you've bought a copy in the last five years, but people don't want to play that. People want to play the incredibly ugly 1970s edition of life that they had in their grandparents' house. Well, because it's funnier and there's also like that, there's that nostalgia quality where it's like, it feels like an artifact of its time that you're like you're kind of dusting it off you're like well there's there's also like the the timeliness of it too because they're very much frozen in the era that they were manufactured like as games are sort of like the same game now is completely different with the content held within like the rules are the same and the mechanics are the same yeah but you know the card which you know at first would have read something like that something very 70s like you know professional hippie wrangler is now going to be like <laughs> <laughs> like full stack developer right like it's it, it, yeah, they, sure, they reflect sure. the time that they were made in or like the different versions of games that existed for years like the best example is monopoly oh god you can get anything version of monopoly now or risk uh for that matter um but it's like, just a franchise thing now like star wars force awakened came out uh force awakens came out Fucking new Star Wars Monopoly came out too. Oh, it's like I swear Star Wars Monopoly has been a thing for a while anyway. Um, well, they take any popular franchise and like they're just like, how can we make, how can we convince people to buy three hundred sets of Monopoly? Well, so, yeah, I mean that my family is no different. I got fucking Garfield Monopoly. That was oh, a horrible man. decision. This is true. Yeah, he actually does. He probably <laughs> played it with me. Deep Dark Secret. I have never played that game with you, and that is a point of pride. Sorry, that would have been a point against you, I guess, in the board game cred world. It street, really would be Monopoly. In spite of the fact that our man. cafe bears the name of Monopoly, Monopoly it is. It is. Oh boy, I will never. I will never Shall suggest speak its name. that you play Monopoly. Well, it's it's not really that interesting, to be honest. It's just 
It's very Wall, much like it's Wall Street. <laughs> it's the Wall game. Street, yeah, the game. There's actually a genre of game that it's a part of, uh, which are called roll, roll and moves. It's code for boring. <laughs> a roll and move game is a game where on your turn you roll the die, you look at the number, you move that many spaces, and if you land on a spot that tells you to do something, you do it. Mm, Back in the day, okay, this has a huge historical backing, though. I'm gonna make this totally clear. Monopoly was not the first game to have you roll a die and then move in a direction. People have been casting lots and moving their pieces around the map for centuries, longer than that. In fact, back in the 1500s, there was a game called the Royal Game of Goose, <laughs> uh, which became very popular in Spain because the monarchy enjoyed it, and then moved around Europe in some ways, and it was, honestly, it was just snakes and ladders. Uh, you roll the dice and you're trying to get to the top. Some spaces send you back, some spaces send you forward, and in fact, this game was so popular back in the day that people, uh, okay, so the board had certain symbols which you, which people who played it knew you moved this many spaces forward or back. And the symbols didn't say move forward or back. They were just so universally known amongst players that, that they knew, oh, you, you move to this spot when this happens. That's how, that's how common this game was. And it declined in popularity after that to the point where in an 1800s history of board and card games, it was a footnote. It was like a trivial game for weak minds. <laughs> so this is not a new thing, roll and move. And that's part of why I'm so sad when I talk to people who don't know the world beyond the roll and move game, who've never tried any of the interesting new things that are happening in board gaming because sometimes, okay, sometimes I'll recommend a game to a customer. Now this is a monologue. I'll recommend a game to a customer and they will, uh, they will say, but that sounds interesting. I'll teach them how to play. And I know that things have gone to shit with my board game teach if they then ask, uh, cool, when do we roll the dice? Uh. Oh no, <laughs> I've done you wrong. <laughs> the explanation is not stuck at all. <laughs> well, the expectation's always different, right? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's an interesting thing to bring up because, um, I think before I ever played probably the gateway uh, the gateway board game to this sort of world um, would be Settlers of Catan. Uh, that's probably your most kind of, I hate to use the term, but mainstream kind of worker placement game. Or not worker placement, sorry. Um, but I guess resource management? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I mean, you no, roll, it's true. You, you do, revolutionized resource. Okay, all you right. You do roll a dice. You, you, you roll dice in that game, but it's not to move. It's to de determine like who Resources gets who gets there, what yeah. resource. Right. To right. give you context for how like crucial the revolution that Catan inspired in acquisition of resources was in the late '90s, developers of board games in Germany, which is, I have no idea why, but board games are just. They're gangbusters in Germany. There is a board yeah. game. I, I feel like there's a board game designer on every street corner. <laughs> it's kind of like black metal in, in the Nordic countries. Yeah. It's not really true that everyone plays board games in Germany, but they are known for it. It's there's a great in the culture. Right. Yeah. So uh, in the years following uh, the development of Catan, develop, developers of games were just scrambling to try to think of something as clever as the way that Catan gets players resources. Uh, which for anyone not familiar is you roll dice and if you have a building beside a spot with the number on the dice you get that thing. Uh, really cool, very different from the standard every turn you get one thing or even roll the dice and and then move this many spaces and you get that many things. Really cool, changed it all uh, and so Alex is not mistaken when he says resource management board game. Yeah, worker placement is a different type of game which you introduced me to um, and I'm very grateful for that because uh, going to Snakes and Lattes that first time and then eventually Monopo Latte um, there's a lot of board games that people just don't know about and some are not great but a lot of them are, are, are at least interesting and the benefit of having, um, having a, a buddy kind of on the inside is that Kurt know like he's already sifted through the shit and you know what's interesting and kind of you have a pretty good eye for 
what is going to interest a certain kind of person and you can kind of lead them to you're kind of like a, a uh, this might sound bad but you're kind of like a really good blockbuster employee <laughs> <laughs> who's like what kind of movie do you like and they're like eh, i'm looking for something like romantic and but also kind of like with some action in it and it's like oh well let me direct you over here like i think you'll like this and then you know you kind of have an inkling about uh about what people might be drawn towards. No, that's a huge part of my job. Actually, I'm going to sound like a pompous ass when I say this, but I usually say I'm kind of a sommelier of board games. The people come in and I say, oh, perhaps you'd like this board game paired with your evening, sir. <laughs> uh, and it's it's a huge part of my job to direct people because m many, many people are, have no experience in the world of modern board gaming, and they'll come in and say, ah, ha, 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 and wet themselves when they look at the play? wall of board games. <laughs> There's just, there's so many. It's what about impossible. Twister? It's impossible to Twister. figure out what's good if you don't know anything about what's there. Uh, this is called by economists as, uh, it, it's, it's actually a described phenomenon. If you go to the grocery store and you want a bottle of Caesar dressing, yep. uh, and there's X amount of bottles of Caesar dressings in different brands, you're not actually going to look at all of them and pick whatever the best one is for you. You're going to pick the name that you're most familiar with. Correct. Uh, so we definitely Your chances have to... are the one that you've had before. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Familiarity is always a huge, you know, is a, is a factor in that. Right. So, so what are some of your, like, partner. most played, like, the games, like, board games that you're playing personally, where you find that you sort of, like, attracted to and going back to on a regular basis? Uh, to answer that question, I have to describe the genre of board games okay. for any of our <laughs> listeners. Uh, board games uh, come in two main schools these days. One affectionately affectionately known as Ameritrash or occasionally Amerithrash, depending on who you're asking. It sounds uh, like metal to me. <laughs> it is a little bit metal. Okay. It involves a lot of battling each other, a lot of rolling the dice and seeing what happens. Uh, there are a lot of cards that'll mix up the whole thing. Generally, they're associated with a lot of randomness, uh, a lot of player versus player. Uh, often it's war-ish, but it's not always. Sometimes you run into things like Zombicide that Alex mentioned earlier, right. where you're questing against zombies. They're in intensely thematic and are very much about uh, the experience of whatever it is they're trying to emulate. Whereas on the other hand, uh, you have the family of games known as Euro-style board games. Uh, Euro-style board games, named after the part of the world that they tend to be designed in, are board games where you do uh, have some kind of theme, but often it's so loose that it might as well literally be called cubes on the board and you push them around. Uh, yeah. European-style board games are known for having a lower luck content, generally speaking. And they're also known more for about strategy. a little bit more about strategy, yeah. So they, I tend to like the European style board games. They've got stupid art on the cover of like this surly German <laughs> guy, and uh, he's sitting at his desk with a stupid hat on his head. Is it Carcassonne with the really badly drawn like castle and knight? Is Recently, Carcassonne re-released a fifth edition, which looks much less stupid. <laughs> yeah, but I remember you introduced me to that game, and uh, we had a good laugh about the uh, the boxer. It's it's ugly. It's, it's adorable. What's the content of this game? I, it sounds familiar. Like it sounds like I've heard of it. Carcassonne is a tile placement game, which Where looks you're a building lot like a castle. Puzzle. Yeah, a castle and some roads and fields. Yes. Okay, Every yeah. turn, you'll place a tile and then maybe put a homie on that spot to try to claim some points from that region. Oh, oh, homie. You have to connect roads to roads, rivers to rivers, yeah. this kind of thing, yeah. It's like your grandpa's puzzle. But it's not your grandpa's puzzle anymore! It won the 2001 Spiel des Jahres Award, which is a prestigious German board gaming honor. <laughs> Game we know year. all about prestigious uh, honors that nobody else knows of as illustrators. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. No, no kidding. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> but it's, it's those microcosms true. where you have your own sort of communities, right? And everyone has like, you get this award, and you're like, I won this, and they're like, what's it for? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, uh, well, it's like if the Oscars weren't that weren't so well known, it would be the same thing. Well, right? if they weren't televised and you know, contained big actors that you know, everyone knows who they are exactly i mean it's it's the same kind of thing like you're just getting recognized for the work that you're doing in the specific field that you're in just some fields have more publicity than others and some are they tend to be a little bit more closed off too right like yeah. i remember uh someone mentioning 
uh, to us. I think it was in Back in Sheridan that they said that in a time before photography, illustrators were like the rock stars of the art world. And, yeah. you know, people knew, like, everyone knows who Norman Rockwell is, but sure. there was a reason for that, right? So, and it's since then sort of not as big of a thing anymore. Well, the industry changes and uh, you know, stuff happens, you know. Photography maybe uh, not necessarily supplanted illustration as a uh, as a field. Um, I always I, I always hate the people who are like, oh, this new technology came out. That means the old technology is going to be obsolete. There's never going to be a place for it anymore. And it's like, no, it's just a new tool that everybody can use and acquire. Like, I mean, you look at people who are now filming movies on an iPhone. I'm sure the big camera company people weren't like. Oh gosh darn! Now that the iPhone's out, we're gonna go out of business. Uh, plum tuckered out here. Um, it's not gonna happen. Like, like when photography initially was introduced, painters got really worried because it's like, why bother painting anything if you can just take a picture of it? But instead of that happening, they just painted different things. And technology changes things yeah, you know i feel does. like technology renders older ways of doing things into an art form you know you uh you it makes them maybe classicizes them right so you've got a more sure. classic approach to something rather well, you look than... at you look at disney animation right um there are people clamoring for disney to make movies again where it's all hand-drawn and it's like it's incredibly inefficient to do that but there's something about the quality and the nostalgia factor of going back to the old way of doing things that, you know. Analog transfers, though, like, like yes, it's you know inefficient, but it transfers really well to animation. Like, uh, I know we're getting off topic, but you look at a lot of like contemporary animated shows, and because they're using you know flash or uh, digital reproduction, where they can you know use the same asset. And, and just add animation to that asset, and, you know, so if it's a character's walk cycle, you know, they've got keys that say, you know, uh, this loops, this loops, this loops, and you've got a walk cycle. And that character walking through a scene is not rendered up frame by frame. And even if you look at what 15 years can do to technology to a very similar property, you look at when Lord of the Rings came out in the early 2000s compared to the Hobbit films, which came out in the early 2010s, Lord, the Lord of the Rings films are astounding pieces of filmmaking. Again, art from adversity, where they had to make a lot of the stuff real because the technology just didn't exist yet. A lot of the technology that they used for the bigger battles and epic scenes like that, they had to invent to make those things possible. Now you fast forward 15 years later to the Hobbit films. All of this technology now exists. You know, you've got Disney and Marvel making leaps and bounds with their superhero films so you know you've got tech new techniques that didn't exist before and things that are easier to do so you can you can take the easy way out and cut a lot of corners but as a result when i saw those films the the hobbit movies um i felt like part of it suffered as a result like it just didn't it, i hesitate to say that it didn't feel the same it didn't, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It do, not everything has to be the same as it was. But it did feel different in a way that I wasn't a fan of. Like, you know, I, there, there's a place in time for, uh, you know, CG characters. But not when you could just as easily make it real. Like, I, I love, uh, like, the rubber suits of the Urukai in... Um, the original Lord of the Rings movies. Like, those guys look terrifying because they were there. They were physical presences that had no, like, CGI makeup or digital altering to make them look scarier. They were scary because that's how they were made initially. And then, you know, you go to The Hobbit, you got the white orc guy who's a completely digital character, and it's just, you lose something in the, uh, you lose something in the interim. Yeah. Right. And board games have done something cool, too, because I'm, I'm sure at some point, <coughs> uh, people you know in the industry were like the video games are becoming massively popular and there has been a decline in the popularity especially in north america um because of you know and it, if, i don't know if you're familiar with this production it's called vamblier they do a lot of like really retro -y, very like out of the box games like they do video games but the the the, the guy in charge is um he's 
he's from Norway, but he's not like he's not Nordic in origin. Like he's mixed. He's Arab and Nordic. So his perspective is that video games have become such that they've become closeted in the North American market, where the the manufacturing of these games and the the content of these games has become super localized to the U.S. and the United States, and it's preventing people from other walks of life in other parts of the world from using the tools to make the games. So they're not able to get proper represent. Like they want to make games, but in order to do that, they need to learn another language. They need to learn another language in another software language, and and the games might not take off at all because the expectations are are not in their favor right right and i'm i'm guessing like with with board games they had a similar issue where they had to revitalize the scene in order to you know continue being as as popular and it's sort of come back where people are noticing yeah no board games aren't fucking it's not trouble and sorry from our childhoods and, no, you know what we were sold as kids they're much deeper now a lot of people talk about a board game renaissance I don't really believe in the board game renaissance. I think that this is new completely. There's never been, I don't, I, as far as I understand the industry, there's never been such a large market for board games and such a surge of interest in these different aspects. Right. Uh, you're totally right though, that the market became very North American for a long time. Uh, in the late 1950s, a designer who later became known for war games uh did he was a he was a student at a prestigious university and he wanted to develop a tactical simulation for u.s troops um so he was actually the original developer of the hexagonal board as oh. we know it in board games you see this in Catan, but yeah. on a much smaller scale this was used for years in war games because instead of being able to move left right up or down like you could in a chessboard Hexagonal games allow you six directions of movement. Yeah. Um, so this became a huge development in the North American board game industry because you developed a whole genre of war games. And for whatever reason in America, these war games and the people who played them, who came to be known as grognards for reasons I don't really understand. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, you have grizzled like 80-year-old grognards at board game conventions. That sounds yeah. like an alien race that we'd come across they've on got, the show. Yeah, they've got... <laughs> I am grognard. There are wild grognards. You know, They're like the Klingons. <laughs> yeah, really. The grognard warbird. If you go to a convention these days, a board game convention, you'll see, and I mean a board game convention that has retained its original base. There aren't a whole lot of those. Can Games, based out of Ottawa, is the oldest one in Canada. It's been running since the 70s. And so you have a few different walks of life. One of them are these old school, like North American war gamers who really latched on to this idea as board games, as a combat tactical simulation, right. miniatures representing your pieces, the whole culture of making a, a stage on which these battles would happen, historical accuracy, but dice rolling and maneuvering. Big publishers like Avalon Hill were known for their historical battle reenactments, and newer publisher or publishers that are still producing games like GMT were known for war games. And none of that will matter at all to anybody who is just becoming aware of the world of board games. But what does matter is that that old guard is contrasted hugely with these new European styles of game that I alluded to earlier. Um, and both of those people being at the same convention results in a very strange mix of people from different walks of life and with different ideas of what constitutes a board game. I imagine. Well, I used to, I used to be really into uh, Citadel Games, their, their franchises like Warhammer, um, yeah. specifically 40k, and that's essentially what it is. It's <laughs> it's the idea is that you will expend exorbitant amounts of money on pieces of plastic paint them and then they represent troops in a future apocalyptic like dystopian world yeah and you you know you measure distances and you move your units and you roll dice to see whether they shoot and whether they hit and whether they take a wound and whether they do another thing and it's and it becomes very like it's not like i think i was attracted to it for the reasons that it was a very creative endeavor, like you painted every single model, right? Yeah. And the the more I looked at it and analyzed it, I was like, man, this game is fucking boring because this there's 
yes, you know, it can be super climactic, but in the end, you're moving little plastic guys at other plastic guys, and then you roll some dice and you take them. Yeah, I uh, put them in a box. I, I remember being kind of initially attracted to um, like the Warhammer figurines, not because there was a game around it, but because I just like the idea of like painting miniatures and stuff. Um, I don't really own any except for um, when they came out with the, after the movies came out, they came out with a line of Lord of the Rings miniatures. And for Christmas one year, I got a Balrog because it's my favorite. So I put, I got to put that together and, and paint it. Never played with it in any respect, just put it on my shelf and I was like, that's, that looks pretty cool. So <laughs> I didn't have to reenact like the entire, you know, War of the Ring or anything. I, like I was never interested in that. Um, with the hexagonal uh, map system with those war games, um, would you say there's a definite relation to uh, Sid Meier's uh, Civilization series? Have you ever played those? Uh, the game series on the computer, yeah. I have not uh, played directly with, but it's absolutely partially a product of uh, the time. I have a lot of heavy board gamers in my circle. Heavy board gamer is someone who likes like a three, four hour board game experience. Right. Uh, and those same people tend to play civilization games. And there's a whole genre of board games called uh, 4X games or Civ it's games. a lot of fun. Uh, if, if you like the slow burn of like yeah. a drawn out session. Yeah. Well, I really like, like I, I hadn't played any Civ games until Civ 5. Um, and when I was out west last year, I had, uh, like I would have days where I'd just have a lot of time. So, I could devote like you know seven or eight hours to a single playthrough and the progression of it was really fun because you were essentially playing a board game just you didn't have to set anything up or move any pieces yourself it was all there and you got to play against a computer and um, it was also equally fun to play with my wife just on the same computer screen and you just take turns and eventually your civilization meets up. Well, I do like that social aspect, and I think that's a hugely important part of board games. There are a bunch of games that are so complex and involved and have so many calculations and factors to factor in, but none of it matters without the face-to-face -face social interaction that's a product of it. Yeah. I'll give you an example from my personal gaming life. This is obscure and bullshit, so I'm just gonna do the bare bones of this, but I've got a game called Die Maka. Und Die Maka was a German game about the German elections which was originally made in 1986. It's like the granddaddy of all contemporary, elaborate German board games. They've all taken things <laughs> from this one early, early, early cube pusher. Cube pusher, what we call hero style <laughs> board games. Pusher. Cube pushers. So this, uh, this older game is all about getting seats in a German election and having your values line up with the values of the party. And you've got limited resources in the form of money and influence over media. You're competing with other players for seats and votes, which translate into seats. And you can influence the board later. It's seven rounds. It's five hours. It's huge. But none of it would matter. And in fact, I can't imagine ever convincing anybody to play a five-hour board game about the German elections. None of it would matter unless you had the face-to-face interaction of the players this affects this person yeah. which will affect me i can form an alliance with this person i can discuss my plans with this person i want to do this but oh what if they do it first and so uh, so much of board gaming i feel like is informed by the idea that people want people crave this this person-to-person -person interaction that i think the video game industry has moved away from somewhat and i'd like to speak on that um particularly in a game that just got released that went backwards in so many ways. Um, EA released uh, their Battlefront, or their version of Battlefront anyway, uh, Star Wars Battlefront, after the, uh, just to line up in tandem with the movie release. And the previous two installments of the Battlefront series were excellent games. Um, you know, they had a they had an interesting campaign that you could do uh, co-op. So you get a, a couple friends and play split screen on the same TV. You know, you're shoving each other on on the couch and you know having a good time. And now, I I own the new Battlefront because it came with my PS4 when I got it. I have not picked it up at all, and I have no interest in ever playing it 
unless they actually put in a single player campaign, which they do not have. They strip that out. They have like challenges or something. Like I, I, I got it too, but I Whatever. bought it on sale. It was like forty dollars. I was like, you know what? I think that's a reasonable price to pay for this game. It's still a little bit much, but I'm not gonna pay eighty dollars for it. That much is for sure. Yeah, but it's and that's the other thing is it's not eighty dollars to buy the game. It's eighty dollars to buy the game as it came out at launch. Yeah. It's another fifty to buy the season pass. To get all the downloadable content that will be added later oh that goodness. they should have just released the game later 130 dollar video game oh yeah that's industry that, standard though at this but, point and, wow but that's mostly I had EA. no idea that's that's mostly ea though um, no that's that's not just ea because okay so fallout 4 they're they're the com the king company of microtransactions though and i i would disagree that, i think that that's DLC. the industry's sort of general direction as a whole i would yeah. say that it, it's not it's a bad it's direction. not a specific company that's doing it it's all of them because they realize that there's money in it people will pre-order even though in my personal opinion they shouldn't pre-ordering's a bad way of legitimizing that kind of behavior from companies to incentivize them to to release unfinished games and then charge you for well, yeah, DLC be, because they know that people are lined up to buy the game no matter what state it's in when it comes out yeah it's just a desperation they're like yeah we can milk this it's fine people don't care obviously they just want the title yeah. and that's evident with Star Wars and you know Fallout 4 suffers from that it's don't get me wrong Fallout 4 is a great game it's enjoyable but I haven't touched it in months because I got fucking bored There's well I got bored too, but I got bored after 150 hours. So. Yeah, I did not hit that many. I think I hit like, I, uh, I I hit okay. like 40, 50 hours. And after that point, I'm like, I'm revisiting the same places over and over again. That's when it started to lose me. Um, sorry, we're going to get off topic for a minute here. Didn't you guys have a whole Fallout episode? We did. We kind tried of. We tried to, but we got we got off topic again. Well, okay. <laughs> but Kurt, you Just played... a couple minutes on Fallout. Yeah, you, Kurt, you've played Fallout 3 extensively. Sure. Um... So you know that when you go through a location and you clear it out of enemies, those enemies stay dead, they never respawn, and for all intents and purposes, that location remains empty forever for the rest of the game. Not so with Fallout 4. They don't necessarily have respawning enemies, it's just that there are quote-unquote roving bands of like super mutants or raiders that take up residence there but it's essentially respawning and it's not only that but it's respawning of enemies as well as resources so if you pick an area clean then you're like cool that's like a little check next to like bunker a b2 i'm gonna go to the next one now um because that's how i like to play those games suddenly you get a quest to, like you gotta go to bunker a b2 and i'm like sweet you can just fast travel there start looking around all the stuff I picked up is there again. And I'm like, oh, come on. Like, this is just, now it, now it just feels like I'm a janitor having to clean up someone's mess that they keep making. And the, the Raiders exact came same back way. and they were like, oh, I'll just put all this stuff here. <laughs> it's like, that whiskey bottle's gone. Put that right there. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, that that's all we'll really touch on with Fallout 4. Um, but yeah, uh, there's, there's an alarming trend of, of like poor, poor economical sort of standards for video games. And with board games, like, I understand that there are expansions that come out which add to the games, and there's, you know, you're going to pay for those, they're not going to be free, but a board game does not, they don't give you, like, the box with yeah, it doesn't the feel dice like and the rules, missing. right? And, and then you know, they're like, uh, we'll give you the pieces that you play with in, like, maybe a month? Yeah. Or, you know what? When you take it home, we'll mail it out to you, so you have it when you Or, like, home. it's only got half the board, and it's like, don't worry, the other half is coming. It's funny you should say that. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about the latest trend in board games, and this oh, is no. very interesting. Uh, it's not actually a bad thing. Uh, what, what's happened recently is, first they did it with the Risk series, which many of you might be familiar with from yep. Yawn Childhood and Frustration. Yeah. Uh, now they're doing it with a famous cooperative game called Pandemic. Rob Devio, De I don't know how to pronounce his name, sorry Rob, who is not listening to this, <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, Rob. is a Shut designer <laughs> uh, who just jumped on to this new thing called Legacy Series Games. In a Legacy game, Pandemic Legacy or Risk Legacy, when you play the game, you go through it as you normally would, 
but at the end of the game, the first time you play it, something will happen, which will permanently change the board. It'll instruct you to open like a secret envelope that's included with the game that you weren't allowed to look at before. Okay. And then you add like a permanent sticker or like pawn or something to modify the whole game. The, the next time you play it, it'll be completely different. But that doesn't feel like an incomplete game. That feels more like New Game Plus. It's basically a campaign. Uh, yeah. Pandemic Legacy is built such that you can only play it about... I don't remember if it's 12 or 24 times, but every time you play it, you're one month further into the infection of the world. It's this cooperative board game that you're trying to rally against these diseases in. That actually sounds cool, though. It's super cool. It's actually rocketed to the number one position on Board Game Geek, which is an important resource for board game information. And uh, and we're wondering if it's like the next big trend or these board games where, I mean, you literally play through the game and you get to a certain step and it'll say, all right, your character's dead. Rip up the card. <laughs> so yeah, you play through it. But that's pretty badass. Like, it's that's, really cool. That's, yeah. that's pretty ballsy of them to do. And that it feels innovative. It doesn't feel like they're trying to squeeze money out of you. It's interesting because it's kind of the opposite of, of what you're saying with an endless addition to this game. These games that they've got they there are like, you play it and then, and then <laughs> that's there's it. nothing, yeah. <laughs> you destroyed it, didn't you? <laughs> but, but I think that's, that's kind of... It, it, it's a similar idea where rather than just adding stuff on it, it's like, okay, well, unless the the cost is, is reasonable. Like, you know, board games aren't necessarily cheap either. Though. True. No, um, but they're, yeah, the, the, the amount of budget that a board game has is probably infinitesimal next to a AAA title. That is true. For, for video that game. is true. So I, I and I can see, you know, like I I wouldn't mind having a board game which has a finite number of plays in it, and then if I really want that experience again, buy it again. Just go and get it again. Support the thing that you love, right? So they sure. make more of, of similar kind of things. But with with video games, it's like, well, you know, we're gonna add like Destiny. I play Destiny on and off, and the idea is that it's. Uh, an RPG space shooter X amount of years in the future. It's basically Halo, but more MMO-ish. Yeah, and there's like a loot system and experience and collecting junk, right? So, And if you want any sort of story from the game, you have to go to the website and read about it. Yeah. So they're doing like weird things with the game. Um, but they release like new content every six-ish months. Um, and I think the next update's coming out in April. Right. Um, and it's just like, you know, they add some things. Sometimes it's a big thing. Like, sometimes it's a huge story. Like, they'll add a, a section of campaign into the game, right? But I don't know. Like, it's it always feels like it's like I want to stop, but I'm like, I'm going to want to play that still. For some stupid reason, this game keeps pulling me back. <laughs> Well, but it's, it's, there's a competitive element which yeah. which I play for in on, in video games like online shooters and stuff. It's specifically for a competitive element, playing against other people, and not just. And that's why I think Fallout didn't Fallout Four wasn't doing it for me. It's because I was playing by myself all the time. And perhaps that's a factor why, um, like uh, Destiny and those other types of games, like the online kind of shit like that, doesn't draw me in as much because I'm very much if I. I'm probably not going to play video games with other people. If not I am your friends. I would love to play with my friends, but it's becoming harder and harder to do that. Uh, very few titles these days support just on the couch multiplayer. Um, well, you have Diablo 3. I do have Diablo 3, and that's probably the best example of how to do it correctly. It's amazing. It has you, online multiplayer as well, right? You it know? has online multiplayer, okay. but the couch the, the couch, is the the couch part, multiplayer yeah. is so good like my wife and I will play it and um, it's great because you could be playing your own your own story just like uh, by yourself someone feels like dropping in all they have to do is turn on the controller sign into their profile and then press X and they're in the game and no matter what level they are they will get uh, they'll get their stats boosted so that they're of similar strength to your character and then they'll level up a little bit faster so that it'll close the gap. Right. And if they feel like they're done, all they have to do is drop out and then you can you keep playing by yourself. Like it's fantastic. This should be the example of what every like multiplayer game should be striving to do. Like I can't think of a better a better way to do it. Um like, it's also very gauntlets. It's a very gauntlet legends kind of uh kind of way to do it. Dropping and, in and out. Yeah, yeah. And that was uh 
That was one of our favorite mm, kind of food. <laughs> food is good. <laughs> Red Warrior has gained a level. It's funny we should talk about video games and board games like this because I think I want to tie it all together as we near a close here. Excellent. Some board games these days Ooh. have started involving technological components <gasps> so that you like have... apps. Like apps, yeah. Perish the thought, many people say. I don't want technology in my board games, but the ones that get away with it are only the ones that do it successfully. And I'll say a couple of examples of how this might work. In the very early days of integrating apps, you would run into some things like, oh, it's easier to score if you have the Munchkin app. So you push the up button every time you get a level so that you don't have to add it. Or have pennies. All this does is mean you do a few less calculations. True. But lately, uh, we've come out of a couple of interesting, really innovative uh, pieces of software. One example is a game that's gaining traction right now called Gollum Arcana, which is basically just a video game that happens on a tabletop. Okay. Your figures, because it is a miniatures game, will move around the map, but then there's a whole process of them attacking the other figure, and the game does all the calculations for you. So it's got kind of the best of both worlds. It has the attacking physicality element uh, without any of the calculations you would have to do. It's a war game that happens in front of you, but then you don't have to pull out your calculators. It's really neat. But then you've got a couple of other clever little titles that do interesting things as well. And I'll just mention two more and I'll be I'll, I'll shut up for the rest of this. Uh, so. No, no, this is really interesting. Um, yeah. I hope all of our viewers are, uh, are finding this uh, as cool as like I think Hunad and I are, as we're not experts in this field. So, and <laughs> and I always like, honestly like learning m more things is always you know it's, a, it's should, one of the, some of the best it parts. Should, it should definitely be a goal of this show is that we should learn something every time. I'm gonna plug something at this point. If you do like hearing me ramble on about board games, I'm gonna be coming out with a podcast. Late April, probably around when this is going to come out, uh, called An Open Hand, where I'm going to be talking about the history of board games. So if you want to get into the Star Force Collective expanded universe of podcasts, <laughs> uh, there's a little connection there. Oh yeah, we're building a universe, people. That's, uh, that's right. Um, we will post a link to, uh, to Kurt's podcast, um, provided it's out by the time that we record by the time that we launch this episode. And if not, then we'll tweet about it. We will tweet about it. We'll tweet all over all over the internet with that shit. So don't worry about that. You'll you'll find it. Um, you'll find a way. <laughs> well, love finds a way. But yeah, but what about these other games? Okay, so the two other ones that are most appealing to me. Mm -hmm. uh, one is called the world. I'm gonna get the name wrong. It's called the world of Yuhu, I believe, <laughs> which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't selling incredibly well, but it does something so innovative. It's sort of a sailing and exploration game on a board game. But unlike Gollum Arcana that I just discussed, it's not just a video game with a physical component, it's a board game with a digital component. Your ship that you're sailing across the board is your smartphone. You install an app on your phone, you put it face up on the table, and it's a picture of the grid of the board on which is displayed your ship. Huh. And I'm given to understand that the ship will change based on things that you do in the game. Maybe you load goods and the ship has some goods in it. Maybe you upgrade your ship and you see that it has better sails. I don't know a colossal amount about how the game goes down because it's not the kind of game that we would want to have in the cafe. Too much upfront, like, you need to hub it up. <laughs> but Yeah, a lot of prep work for it. But I've heard it's just fantastically innovative, one of the better games of uh, this year, and I would definitely want to check it out on my own time because it's, it just sounds super cool, perfect integration of the digital and the analog. That does sound pretty awesome. Um, like, a, one of the coolest parts about that kind of game is um, like the progression of, you know, well, whether it be a ship or your character or what have you, is like the progression of things happening in the game affecting the appearance of your of your your character essentially. Like you see this in go way back to Fable, uh, you know, you're good or bad, it affects your appearance. Um, in this game, it sounds like well, maybe your ship takes damage and maybe like a mast is broken or something, or like you know upgrade it to look cooler or something or you're flying a different color flag right part of this is speculation on my part but sure. it's absolutely a game in which your ship is your absolutely. smartphone and it absolutely <laughs> wah, 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 wah. and it just looks really really neat uh, i would recommend checking that out awesome. uh, if you search app board game the world of 
you who's probably right the rest for sure is <laughs> anyway uh the last one that i'm just going to mention here is a game called uh alchemists it should appeal to any fantasy dorks in the crowd it's almost as if you took something set in like the harry potter universe and made it like a grown-up worker placement game suddenly we use that term worker placement which i'll elucidate to the listeners uh it's a game where if you want to do something you put a little marker on that spot to say you did it and nobody else gets to do that thing until the round is over and everybody's little pieces come back to them so it's like every spot on the board is something you get to do when you put a marker down you did that thing yeah you uh, assigned a worker to do it right you placed a worker worker, worker placement, placement. Jinx! <laughs> um, so Alchemist is really, really cool because you're trying to deduce the chemical makeup of different components. Uh, so one ingredient might be a fungus, and you know that there's three elements to every ingredient. This is not very scientifically accurate, <laughs> but there's like a red component, a blue component, and a green component, which can all be big or large and positive or negative. And every game, uh, the whole information about what the ingredients are composed of is reset to something new. Uh, if you think of a deduction game like Clue that you may have played as a kid, there's some kind of mystery that everyone's trying to solve. Alchemists using an app takes it to the next level because you have to solve a mystery that's reset every time that none of the players have any information about at the start of the game. Uh, instead of everybody holding a few pieces of information, every time you combine a couple of ingredients, the cauldron bubbles and then the app says these two ingredients make this color potion you refer to your charts which are like oh this means that it could be composed of this or this and the whole game is trying to struggle to be faster than other players to publish information of uh, academic information about what constitutes these components or to sell your potions to weary adventurers who are like oh an elf potion <laughs> uh, and you actually, it's got a huge sense of humor. You can actually experiment on your interns. So you'll, the first guy is willing to do it for free. Uh, but if he has a bad result, then the next guy you're going to have to pay gold to do it. Oh, so okay. it's got a huge sense of humor. Uh, it's very involved. Um, I heard what happened to the other guy. But effectively what the app does is it, it means that if you didn't have it, there would be one guy who had to look at this big stupid chart every new game. And the whole game, this guy would sit at the side of the table. You'd be like... I mix the mushroom and the and, and the uh, the fern, and he'd be like, "It's a red potion." So, so, it, so it instantaneously gives you a result of these different variables then from a master sheet, which you couldn't be allowed to see if right. you played the game. I see. So uh, it effectively removes like the unlucky chump that you get to. Uh, right. You'd have to have just to some dude it. who couldn't play and had to tell you everything. So it's it's really cool. It does things you couldn't do otherwise, and I love seeing the innovative new marriages of these two realms of games coming together. Yeah, and this is, this is what people should be embracing, is the innovations that technology allows, not not the fear that it's going to supplant something. Like, you know, you have to embrace this type of thing and allow it to enhance the type of stuff that you already know how to do. Um, I, I mean, you, you look at, like, uh, you look at movies, for, an ex for example, like, you, know, you go back to the 60s when Planet of the Apes came out, and I'm sure the effects artists for the uh, the people who made all the prosthetic masks and stuff, whether they were still alive when digital makeup started to become a, really a thing, I'm sure there were prosthetics and uh, practical makeup people who were a little worried that, you know, well, geez, like, what, what's going to happen when um, we're not needed anymore? Like, like, is it just going to be digital artists doing all this stuff? Turns out, no, because... At least where we are now, computers will never or cannot replicate real life 100%. So there needs to be an integration between the two, uh, between practical effects and uh, digital effects to make a truly uh, interesting um, product in the end. Product, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Correction for listeners from earlier, it is world of Yoho, not Yoohoo. So I have added two O's. Yoho sounds a little more shippy, uh, shipply. Um, so that, that makes sense. So it sounds more like a pirate thing to say. Definitely, <laughs> definitely a little bit pirate. <laughs> you get plunder. You do upgrade your boat. Yes, I'm not a crazy awesome. person. You acquire useful items and more powerful weaponry. Amazing. Super cool. I'd love to give it a shot at that some point. That sounds great. That sounds really great. Yeah. And I mean, from there, like if uh, 
that o- that opens up a world of possibilities um because you know you start off with just like you got like a pirate ship oh people are getting hungry um you got like a pirate ship what if it was a spaceship huh huh set it in space yo ho becomes like Zip zap, gorp the dorp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the world of Star Force Collective. The world, world of, of Star- Grognards. The world of Grognards, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, I think that's about all we really can say about board games. Um, it's an interesting time. Like, it's a, an interesting time to be alive um, with uh, not necessarily a board game renaissance, but a board game uprising. Um, because I think there is some exhaustion there in the video game market where, you know, you get your people who will buy every fucking Assassin's Creed that comes out every year, every Call of Duty, every FIFA or what, who has the money, whatever else. <laughs> well, I don't know. Not me, but so there's, there's a weariness there and people want something different and they want human interaction. They don't want to just be like called names online and, you know, have rude things spouted at them. Um, that's not nice. There's, like, you can't, you can't be that mean in person because chances are you're going to alienate some people. So there's a, there's a certain amount of formality. And innovation in board games should challenge innovation in video games because there hasn't been enough. I agree. In the past, I agree. Past long time. And I think we're seeing that with, uh, this new kind of app trend, um, being integrated into, uh, into the board game world um in any case i think the future looks bright if not it looks at least interesting um if only we had carl <laughs> Sagan here to say something beautiful about the future billions and, and billions apple pie <laughs> a glorious dawn well with that inspiring note go watch carl Sagan, and uh you can have a good time with him um Thank you very much for being aboard these past few weeks, uh, Science Officer Kurt. I think we're going to let you down uh, on Earth now. Um, do you have anything, any last words to say before we let you go? Uh, no, that's pretty much all we came on to do here. So, Wicked. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you're in Ottawa, you should definitely check out the Board Game Cafe, Monopolate. Monopolate. And uh, Kurt's podcast will be dropping very soon, if not already. Um, called an open hand. open hand history of board games history of board games starring kurt ruffling and maybe who knows maybe who not and i will uh we'll pop in <laughs> for an episode we'll play some games with you man we'll do some crossovers yeah yeah start building this uh star force universe anyway um i'm commander alex thank you very much for uh for coming on for coming on board again with us huh, coming on board but i'm uh, yeah. uh, 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 that was a bad pun to leave it on. Anyway, thanks for uh, thanks for showing up again, guys, and listening and listening to us ramble about all this random nerdy crap. Uh, we love you very much, and we'll see you on the next one. Commander Alex signing off. Bye bye. <laughs>